Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining for another webinar about systemic approaches in business and organization. That's our topic of this series. So today, I want to share a few thoughts about how to apply systemic approaches for teams or in team situations, for example. <clears throat> So without uh, further ado, uh, let's get into uh, the topic. <clears throat> um, the um, discussion about this actually started uh, some time ago um, when we had a, a training or education series about systemic approaches in organizations. And uh, many people were asking, OK, what can I do as a simple next step in order to involve the team and raise more awareness about uh, systemic aspects in organizations in general, but also uh, start applying uh, the insights on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. <clears throat> so um, the, the topics that I have in mind today is uh, talk a little bit about uh, understanding the systemic approaches uh, for team dynamics and a little a uh, very simplified framework uh, I have developed over, over the years. And uh, then I want to show a few uh, practical tools that I use in my work and that you can also apply in your work in, uh, in teams or with teams. So depending if you are a team member, <clears throat> a team leader, or you are um, in general terms, a helper, for example, uh, a coach, a change consultant, um, a manager of managers, uh, often we have coach managers as coaches or mentors. So um, these are the, the typical scenarios. And <clears throat> then I will point you to a couple of new tools. And one of the tools is uh, very new. So I would encourage you to take a look at that. Now, I want to lead with this um, uh, phrase here, system conditions drive behavior. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, everything is deterministic, but when um, we, we understand the uh, feedback structure, for example, of a social system, and by social system, I mean, for example, an uh, enterprise, a, a group in general, a family organization, etc. So when we understand the, the fabric of the system, we can also better understand why uh, things happen uh, the way they happen over time, especially. So how does change happen over time? Or why are we unable to move forward with a certain topic or an issue uh, that is bothering us in the organization, for example? <clears throat> but oftentimes, um, people in organization lack the uh, understanding of the uh, systemic aspects, both from um, let's say, uh, an inner game perspective, uh, so the, the soft factors as well as the quantitative changes over time. I will talk about that a little bit later. Now, here's a little uh, framework and uh, kind of the direction I'm moving forward in with my work. So I'm generally um, distinguishing between uh, two spheres which have to come together. One is the relational sphere and the other one is the rational sphere. In the relational sphere, we talk about relationship between people, between humans, but also uh, with other entities such as organizations or entire ecosystems, for example. And by ecosystems, I mean <clears throat> uh, not the pond in the garden, but the, for example, a business ecosystem. A uh, good example for that is a supply chain. So the supply chain partners, the suppliers are part of an ecosystem or, uh, for example, commercial ecosystems where you have partners in the marketplace which are supporting an organization which are taking care of sales, service, et cetera, working with clients. So in the, on the relational side, we, we are interested in teams, the stakeholders, the culture, the fabric of the organization, and the, the soft factors, so everything that has to do with relationships. And on that side, we often struggle with 
um, certain difficulties uh, that uh, we, we cannot move forward. A, a good example that I see very often is that an organization is struggling with innovation or renewing itself or succession as a special case of renewal in organizations. On the other side, the, the rational factors here we deal often with um, things we can count and measure and which we can see changing over time very clearly. So we're dealing with resource allocation, we're dealing with the results in business, we talk often about performance indicators or key performance indicators, Yeah, like for example, revenue per salesperson per month or uh, how many customers you can serve or how many projects you can deliver per month, et cetera. But also we're dealing with changes, uh, changing uh, in the organizational structure, that's very obvious, but also changes in the way of uh, new behavior, for example, that we are trying to cultivate in an organization. And typically we often have to deal with imbalances. Um, very uh, common imbalance is the imbalance between um, the workforce and the work to do. So either we have too much work to do and relative to that little workforce or so people to do the work, which leads to uh, oftentimes overwork, stress, burnout, increasing error rates, etc. And uh, on the other side, sometimes we have to uh, little work to do. And that also creates a stress for the organization. It can create a fear, for example. What happens if we're not making more money? Uh, do we need to cut down and um, reduce certain parts of the organization? So there are certain imbalances. And uh, when an organization is getting into imbalances, there's also often a lot of finger pointing happening. So uh, that's when we kind of move the burden and move the fault and the guilt to somebody else. You know? Now, uh, what makes the work in the rational side so difficult is uh, here we are dealing with the quantitative feedback loops or qualitative feedback loops. We're dealing with delays. Uh, typical form are information delays, uh, which means we take more time than we should to make decisions to bring in new people or to replace a part of the organization etc and we are dealing also with accumulation that means that <clears throat> um, things are accumulating over time and these can be quantitative things i'll talk about that in in a moment but also qualitative things such as Customer satisfaction is a good example. No? It's accumulating over time. So if customers have good experience, it's accumulating. But then if there is, a, for example, a quality issue, then customer satisfaction or trust is eroded very quickly. And it takes a long time to get it back uh, established. Okay, um, some of the uh, relational approaches, just very simple things that you can do and start with. Uh, for example, simple lineups. I will show you in a moment uh, one example that you can apply almost every day in your business. But also introducing uh, team members and help them understand what are the systemic orders in an organization. Or uh, organizing a treasure hunt if you have a bunch of new people starting, send them around in the organization and let them find certain, certain things, encounter certain people, for example. But also we can take a look at accelerating uh, ideation and uh, brainstorming, for example. <clears throat> now, here is a, a, a situation, an artificial situation. So here we have uh, people representing uh, different uh, job roles or departments. So we have uh, the production uh, person, sales, the founder maybe of the company who is now doing research and development, a service person, human resources, the managing director. And these can be individuals or entire groups. And uh, one simple thing that we can do in order to raise the awareness about systemic orders, um, one thing I, I often do as a first step is I ask them, okay, 
can you stand in a similar way how you would uh, how you would see yourself on the org chart. No? And maybe it looks something like this. So where we have um, a currently managing director and uh, he has direct reports, maybe three. One is person is responsible for sales and marketing, the other one for service and another one for production, maybe another one for um, human resources, finance and administration and so on. And on the other side, we might have the founder who maybe had, had founded the organization or the, the business, but is now mainly involved in research and development. Very common, actually, that uh, the founders are uh, trying to find their place in the organization where they uh, find the, the, the most um, impact or joy. And that often is something like research and development. Some founders are gravitating more towards doing external work and working with customers and, and so on. Now, and then as a next step, I ask them, can you stand in the order of time in the organization? And this represents one fundamental systemic order. The key thing that we have to remember here is that those who were there first have a higher rank from a systemic perspective. Now, that's different from the place in the org chart that is different from uh, the salary that somebody is receiving or the the bonus for a work. So that's one fundamental or, uh, order. And then uh, typically what happens when we do this, especially starting the work with a new team, is that pe people start giggling or laughing because suddenly they realize, well, I don't know about the others, how long they have been here, and often surprises that somebody has been there for a much longer time than we actually thought. And here is a situation, also very common, that uh, obviously we have the founder here on, on uh, position number one or rank number one, so has the, uh, she has the highest rank, for example. Then maybe uh, there was the marketing person who come in, came in, is the longest time in the organization, then production, service, sales, etc. And then uh, we often find that we have a new managing director. Now, oftentimes, and this is, this is uh, something that people, most people don't get right from a systemic perspective. Uh, even if you are responsible for the organization, if you have the highest rank in the org chart in the, the so-called formal hierarchy, from a systemic perspective, if you were the last person who joined the organization, your place would be the, with the lowest rank. Uh, and that's uh, sometimes even hard to understand, hard to, hard to swallow also for some people who, who thought, well, I came in here, I was hired to be the... Uh, executive or managing director, how come that I'm ending here on the on the last place? But this is a very fundamental order in in organizations, and oftentimes this order is violated that people are not on their place in the organization, and that creates uh, a certain friction and dissonance, and often is a cause of fundamental conflict. Now, without going too much into the details about the background, um, I want to step to another scenario. And for example, let's say we have a new colleague, uh, let's call her or him the newbie. And uh, one practice is that we assign somebody to the newbie, the new person, and uh, say, okay, a buddy, for example. And newbie and buddy are spending some time together to make sure that newbie is introduced into the organization. Now, often what happens on people's first day is they meet the, the boss, no? so they know who is in charge, who is the, who's the sheriff here in, in this town. But from a systemic perspective, it would be much uh, more effective if we introduce them to those people who were there before everybody else, so who have the longest tenure in the organization. And um, in order to establish a contact, we can simply ask uh, a question such as, uh, please, what is important here in the organization? And this serves uh, several purposes. And uh, one of them is that 
the those who were there first are feeling seen and heard and respected and this is a much better start than if you ignore those who were there first and you put yourself on a on a place that might not be the appropriate place from a systemic perspective you often see that in organizations when uh, those who were there first they stand there and they say they they go like this no? so they're crossing the arms that typically means that the shop is closed no so there's no contact here and uh they have a lot of internal power often no? these are often the people who have a lot of connections and um very important for example for change initiatives or if we want to get certain things done in the organization here's another approach uh, which i like to do often as a very simple exercise i ask people to represent different stakeholders in their organizations so um, when we have an open seminar with many many participants we often choose somebody else uh, who can who is not part of the system and who can be a representative. And then we ask them to represent, for example, the distributor, the, the supplier, the HR person, et cetera. And then we ask them to um, go with the inner movement in the way how they um, see that uh, these relationships happen and how people are related to each other or how people move or being moved in the organization. Oftentimes that leads to surprising and very immediate uh, effects. Uh, so you might see that, for example, the distributor is turning away. And oftentimes this resembles what we see in organizations, what we experience in organization. And when this um issue for example comes to the surface that is often the starting point of uh, the betterment or the improvement in organization you could also say the healing in organization when we have a conflict or if something is really seriously happening in an organization so very simple i call this the stakeholder or, uh, constellation now i would always advise not to a play with these tools in the sense that we we take it lightly i would always recommend engaging a um, constellation facilitator who has experience especially in the business and organizational context that's super important it's serious work and it serves an important uh, often an important purpose for the organization and helps the organization to find its uh, pathway moving forward. So we have to take it seriously. Now, I want to switch gears and uh, come to another uh, area. So the rational mind is also very important. And um, in, in my way of working and my view of the world, I would say that the, uh, the inner movement and the rational mind have to go together. Because at the end of the day, you have to make decisions. You have to inform your decision making. And uh, here's often where we struggle, that we bring these two together, or even let alone understanding the changes over time. Now, um, my preference here is to work with uh, also with simulations and so-called serious game simulations. And this is helpful to train our mental model that we have built up over a situation. Sometimes I'm simply asking people to take sticky notes. So we talk about how everybody believes um, a change is happening, is playing out over time. I'm asking them to draw a chart, a time series chart over time. And when you have 10 people in the room, you often get uh, 15 different opinions. No? And this is bringing to the surface that we have a different mental model, how things happen, how the change happens over time. Now, in this in this part, when we're dealing with quantitative changes, uh, it's a good practice to um, figure out what, what is the feedback structure. And there are certain core building blocks uh, that we can use and, and tools. Uh, one tool is simply a causal loop diagram like this one. And uh, you can read this in, in this way, for example. You can say, 
the more customers we have, the more revenue we're making. More revenue means we can spend more on advertising to win more customers, and that is bringing in more customers and more revenue. So this is what we call a positive feedback loop or a reinforcing feedback loop. The nature of this feedback loop is that it's gaining strength every with every iteration. It's like a snowball. No? It gets the surface of the snowball. It's getting bigger with every round that it makes, and it becomes quicker, uh, more powerful, more massive, etc. Now, um, this doesn't go on forever because typically we also have what we call balancing feedback loops. Now, in this case, you could say, well, if we have more customers, we need to spend more attention to service, which also uh, costs us a lot of money, and that is reducing our advertising spend. So we, sp we can spend less on uh, uh, customer acquisition. We have to spend more on customer retention, for example. And that is uh, balancing this rapid growth. And that's often what we see in marketplaces. So simply articulating this is helping to bring our mental model to the surface and build a um, shared belief of what we believe is the, sometimes we call it the strategic feedback structure of uh, a business, an organization, a trajectory that we are going on. There's another concept I want to mention briefly, and um, here we talk about accumulation. Now, in the simplest, uh, I think probably the simplest way to explain this is that there are certain things in, um, in a social system or a business system which accumulate. So think about this like a bathtub. There's water flowing into the bathtub and the water level is rising, but there's also water flowing out, which makes the uh, water level drain over time. And uh, what are good examples or possible examples of such a bathtub? Um, for example, customer satisfaction. No? So the more good experience we make with the company, the higher our satisfaction. But uh, so for example, you, you have, let's say on-time delivery and you are used to on-time delivery, your satisfaction is very high. But at one time, the organization has trouble to deliver on time. And uh, that is maybe draining your satisfaction. And then it's, uh, or they, they forget an order, for example, and you, you're really angry about that. And then your satisfaction drops very quickly. Now, these things happen over a long period of time. And um, from an, um, let's say, evolutionary perspective, our human mind, our brain is not uh, well equipped to deal with resource accumulation, especially if we talk about several of these bathtubs in organization. Other forms of bathtubs are customers, employees, employees, for example, by hiring new employees or employees leaving um, money in the bank and these kind of things or orders or uh, finished products in the warehouse, etc. Now, um, in in uh, workshops and also some teachings I'm I'm giving at universities, I like to use the what we call management flight simulators, and these are um, easy to use simulations, which enable the player or the teams to interact with um, such a feedback system. Yeah. And one, one of these uh, tools is uh, what we call this marketing or market dynamics, which is producing a certain pattern over time. And um, you can see this here below there, there are these certain, this very popular um, S-shaped growth curves, which happen a lot in pretty much every case of product adoption, but also in internal change management. And the point here is to better understand um, how the system is behaving under different conditions and different settings. Same system, same feedback structure with different set of conditions or parameters can produce different outcomes. So uh, here you see kind of almost familiar curves no? where you have a very rapid uptake and then it's uh, also turning around and 
reducing. So here the acquisition rate is suddenly reducing. These are typical examples in organizations which cause a lot of stress and concern and uh, also a lot of uh, conflict uh, between organizations. No? So think about if your sales rate suddenly is, is capsizing and for you go from party into crisis, like within a short period of time, then uh, that is creating a lot of concern in organizations. So um, the point about this is to also understand um, what is the feedback structure and which feedback loops are dominating in which part of this change process. Um, that's a typical way of doing this without explaining this structure here. Uh, this is a very typical word of mouth feedback structure that we, we work with. And it's not only a graphical representation, but we use um, this as a simulation model. So this is the basis of simulation. And that's where we bring together not only the feedback structure and how the system is behaving over time, but also what is happening on the relationship level. So how do we need to interact with such a system if we are facing a crisis or if we want to drive change faster or maybe slower? That's also happening. No? Uh, one case where we wanted to drive uh, adoption or, or infections slower was during the pandemic. You remember when there was the talk about flattening the curve. You could you could also achieve the exact opposite when you say we we have to change very quickly in the organization. How can we accelerate that? How can we make sure that everybody, every part of the organization is going through the change more quickly? So we need to understand that. And this can inform our communication, our awareness, communication, decision making and action and i believe this is uh, the way forward in uh, order to develop a higher level a more effective level of systemic leadership in business and organization so uh, oftentimes we start this with uh, warm-up exercises we run a simulation round we do a debrief sometimes a second round and uh, then from there we go into action planning for the organization Always it's important to have a transfer, not just to have a good time and, and a team exercise, but to figure out what are our insights and how does it relate to our current business challenges or our, our trajectory, our path forward. Now, um, in summary, uh, before I, I want to uh, share another new tool that uh, has just been released, um, so what are the key takeaways? Um, first of all, we need to understand and combine and, and foster our understanding of relational aspects and rational aspects. These go together. Um, you can be good in one area, but if you cannot translate it into the other, you kind of starting from a difficult situation. You, you need to work on becoming more integrated in your approach. Secondly, I would encourage to play more and the experiential learning, the playful learning is a good way to not only um, release some tension in the organization, but to engage more people and drive more understanding of how the fabric in an organization is working. Number three, I can uh, um, always emphasize that learning in a team improves the impact. What does it help if only one person in the organization is fascinated by systemic constellations or management simulations or whatever you do, but everybody else has no clue? And if you don't speak the same language, um, your efforts will not have any impact. So engaging others, learning together, being a learning community, for example, is a good starting point to um, uh, drive to higher levels of uh, efficiency and happiness and effectiveness. So here's a, a small tool that uh, I have developed. Um, 
and uh, it's called the Systemic Leadership Quiz. So you can scan the QR code or uh, click on this link. This is uh, freely available on the constellateur.com website. It's a very short test, so answer a few questions. It takes uh, probably less than five minutes and get a, a score. But also the fun part about this is um, you can uh, then receive a, a short email series with tips about systemic leadership. So try this out, share this with your colleagues. Uh, shared learning experience uh, usually is mo way more effective than if we learn individually. Um, besides that, there are upcoming talks. Um, in the next couple of talks in this series, I will talk about systemic approaches for succession planning. And then after that, we will talk also a little bit more about change management. And maybe we have a little tool there to play with a little bit more. So again, play more and uh, try out new things. Um, in terms of the resources, um, over the years, I've published uh, a lot of webinars like this. So there are many recordings available, including the um, the documentation as PDF for download. So if you go to the website consulateur.com uh, in the section of courses, you will find a lot of free information. So uh, feel free to uh, look at this. There's also this uh, course about the family constellation or organizational constellation worksheet canvas. I demonstrate the use of that here a little bit. So it's a good way also to articulating uh, relationship aspects in organizations, for example. And uh, there are many topics like this. So everything from uh, succession to uh, conflict, renewal, even up to systemic storytelling and uh, kind of pitch training that I'm giving sometimes to entrepreneurs, to startup uh, founders, um, managers of scale-up companies, and everybody who needs to uh, bring their idea across to stakeholders. Yeah, So you'll find this on the website and we will probably pick up some of these topics again over time. So with that, um, this concludes the official part. Uh, as always, feel free to reach out. And um, in this uh, webinar, there will be a little bit more time for Q&A. And um, for those who don't attend live, I... Wish you, as always, good luck.